so yeah let's uh, now get right into the presentation yeah so first we'll look at the tools which we have uh, which our ancestors have used uh, for for uh, doing navigation using the stars using the astro using the astronomical phenomena and using simple science so some of these tools i have listed uh, in in this slide uh, now it it is a very uh, curious observation to see how many of them uh, are used in astronomy so all the all the tools which i have marked with a star with a yellow star all of them are in uh, are somehow related to astronomy so the sundial and cross staff and astrolabe are uh, very much uh, very very common to know but the other ones uh, we will we'll look at in particular sextant which is a very interesting tool we'll look at it in particular so let's move on to the next one also the two uh, also the two tools which i have listed which are not explicitly related to astronomy we will also talk about them because even they are very important uh, in navigation all right so as you can see uh, on the left hand side of the screen uh, the tool which we are which uh, i have posted is uh, is called as a sextant so a sextant is nothing but an angle measurement tool uh, sextants are generally used to to get the angles or angle of elevations angle of elevation meaning the angle from the horizon of any celestial body so uh, to do that it is a simple mechanism we will get into that in the next slide on the right hand side you can see the sun dial so again the sun dial uh, is important because it tells us the local time so there are two types of time which we need to know in order to navigate or in order to know your location so one of them is the local time and uh, the other one is the time at a certain uh, certain position on earth or a certain reference point so in our case in in today's world we take the reference as uh, gmt that is greenwich meridian time so the time in london uh, in in at the greenwich uh, royal observatory the time in london is the standard time throughout the world and we compare all the times with respect to that uh, we'll get into that how how uh, that affects navigation first we'll see how a sextant works so this is just an animation a simple animation uh, of the sextant so on the right hand side you can see the uh, side view of this of this instrument and on the left hand side you can uh, see what we are going to look through the telescope so i'll quickly tell you uh, the parts of the tool first so just follow the cursor uh, this part right here that is the telescope so that is the part through which we are going to look this rectangle the the yellow rectangle is the primary mirror and this yellow rectangle is the secondary mirror both of the mirrors are circular in shape the only difference between between these two is the first mirror or the primary mirror uh, that is a full uh, fully silvered or fully polished mirror whereas the second mirror the one uh, which i am pointing towards right now that is uh, that is partially silvered mirror what that means is only half part of that mirror is polished the half part is transparent half part of that is just transparent glass so when you look look at it when it is in front of you you will see the reflected part of yourself in one half and the uh, uh, and whatever is in the background in the other part the same thing is depicted on the left hand side so uh, the idea behind using sextant is uh, the primary mirror is connected to a sliding arm as you can see okay so this arm uh, it it moves on an arc and there are markings on the arc so we select our celestial body of which we want the elevation or which of which we want the altitude altitude angle and then we move the handle in such a way that the primary mirror takes the light from that celestial body and projects it into the uh, secondary mirror and then we again adjust it in such a way that this celestial body which here we are going to observe it aligns with the horizon in the background so the part which was transparent will show us the horizon and the part uh, which which is a mirror 
will show us exactly the reflection of the celestial body. And once they coincide, we lock our device. And after locking, we look at the angle on the dial. So right here on this arc, there are markings of angles. There is also a vernier scale, as you can see. So this is the vernier scale. It is used to improve or uh, to more accurately predict the angle. So in case of a sextant, the vernier scale, if you, if you combine the effect of vernier scale, we can get an angle which is, uh, we, we can get the accuracy of an angle which is 1 60th of a degree. So just one minute of an angle can be found by using, uh, using a sextant. Pretty uh, easy uh, tool to use, uh, but still very effective. You can also see some uh, lines here some uh, four here and three here so these are nothing but solar filters so uh, we are not supposed to look at the sun directly it can it can harm our eyes so in order to go around that uh, but if we still want to see the sun we use these filters we 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 take them uh, we, we just slide those filters in between the path of the ray of light and that's it your eyes are protected and you get the location of or the elevation of the sun. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Jyotir Vidya Parisamstha, which is a, an astronomical, uh, amateur astronomical group in, in Pune, we have one such sextant uh, at, our, at our office. So if you ever uh, visit Pune uh, on a Sunday, uh, do drop by our office to look at such cool stuff. So this uh, was manufactured in London 220 years ago. So it is a very precious position. As you can see, it is a very small device. Uh, it is fitting inside the uh, palm of my hand. And uh, yeah, it is a beautiful device to use. Uh, one uh, curious observation is on the on the arc of, uh, of the angles, you can see a small lens, right? So that lens is uh, used, it, it, it is nothing but a, a, a kind of a microscope or kind of a magnifying glass. So it is just used to exactly pinpoint what angle we are getting. And uh, just one minute of angle is a pretty good accuracy because on earth, one uh, arc minute of angle uh, is equal to 1.8, approximately 1.8 kilometers. So just by using such a small device, you can tell your latitude uh, with, with accuracy of 1.8 kilometers. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. So let's move on now. Uh, the, the three images which I have shown in this slide, the first one depicts a tool known as nocturnal. So the nocturnal uh, is used to tell time in the night sky. So uh, if you know the date uh, when you are looking for the time, so if you know what day it is in the in the year, by using this device, the nocturnal device, you can tell the local time in the night. Now, uh, to tell the local time in the morning, you can use uh, something uh, like a sundial. But in the night, uh, you have to align uh, this this nocturnal this device with certain three stars. We will see which those three stars uh, three stars are. But if you align the three stars in this tool, you will be able to look at, uh, you, you will be able to find out what the time is, the local time. Again, I'm saying the local time. Uh, then the second image is that of a backstaff. So backstaff is nothing but a device, again, used for measurement of angles. So uh, there is a slider on a, on a scale and uh, you point it towards the horizon and you move the slider such that at a certain point its upper edge is at the celestial it is cutting the celestial body which you are going to look at and the uh, lower edge will be cutting uh, will be cutting the horizon and at that point you lock the device you look at the scale the angles are uh, marked in a linear fashion uh, again not as great as a sextant but uh, again pretty good and the third image, uh, that's uh, that's a compass, but uh, you you'll say that compass isn't a, really an astronomical uh, astronomical tool. But as you can see, that's Captain Jack Sparrow's compass, and there is a small sundial over it. Uh, that's the reason I've used this image because compass along with a sundial is a pretty good 
tool to use so not only the direction but also uh, what time it is in the day you can find out by using such a such a device now let's move on all right so now let's get into how our ancestors uh, used simple navigation techniques to navigate throughout the world uh, and by our ancestors i am going to actually focus on the european cultures there is no doubt even the indians uh, were very good at navigation but uh, the voyages the extent of voyages that europeans did uh, they spread out all across uh, all across the earth and uh, i would like to uh, get deep into that uh, that more so we'll start with the first uh, person or the first culture which uh, went from europe to north america and that was the norse culture or the vikings as we know today so uh, vikings uh, inhabited the southern part of what is today norway norway and sweden so uh, th those people are called as vikings we are, we have a, a complete series on it right so the vikings were the first people or the first civilization uh, to use to effectively use uh, navigation in their naval endeavors so by naval i mean they actually traveled in a ship uh, up to uh, for raiding various uh, shores in europe as well as in north america so there is a map uh, the pink part the pink colored part which i am showing that's just the uh, that's just their their kingdoms their civilization and then all the highlights in the blue here here and here all of those are their voyages so they used a very a uh, simple technique of bioreferingence we'll talk talk about it in the next slide but as you can see a, a very simple method was able to give them the power to raid the shores of scotland the uh, western western europe iceland and even some parts of what is today greenland and canada so they were able to stretch out so far away from their homeland just by using the simple method so this is all in 1000 ad uh, so it is it is not really a very techno savvy uh, time of the human civilization yeah so what they used was a simple uh, icelandic spar so this uh, is a is a mineral which is found in that part of the world icelandic spar has a important optical property called as bioreferingence so uh, bioreferingence what it means is if a light ray is coming inside the or hitting the mineral at 90 degrees if the angle of incidence uh, is exactly 90 degrees then the ray of light is split into two beams the first beam is the extraordinary beam and the second beam is the ordinary beam the ordinary beam traces the same path as the actual beam and the extraordinary beam traces a different path uh, now if the angle this is a very angle specific uh, angle specific property so if the angle is something less or more than 90 degrees the intensities or the brightness in simple terms of these two beams is different so only at 90 degrees the two beams will have same intensity now how can we use this to get around the fact of navigation so the the solution is simple what they did was they uh, they blackened out a certain part or a certain spot on the surface of one of these minerals and then they hold it out into the sky the problem with uh, that part of the earth is uh, it is always cloudy and even you from your experience can know that in in a cloudy weather you are not really able to tell where the sun is right and once you know where the sun is it is easier to navigate at least you know the basic directions east west north south so uh, they used this property of bifringence then what they did was they blackened out or they uh, put a spot a black spot on one of the faces they started scanning the sky from the opposite direction now because of the bifringence uh, there were they, they were able to see two black spots okay but both were of different darkness and only when they were closer to sun or in the general direction of sun only when the sunlight was perpendicular to them only at that time both the uh, black spots were of the same darkness and at that 
that point they they knew that yes this is where the sun is and if you want to travel east keep the sun always on the uh, always on the right hand side of your ship and if you want to travel west like uh, to the americas or scotland always keep the sun on the left hand side of the pole so that was the simple principle they used uh, and with practice uh, you can get an accuracy of 1 to 2 degrees of of the sun's location again an impressive feat for such a small small and very cheap uh, technology yeah so the second instance is the spanish invasion of north and south americas so we all know the famous legend of christopher columbus and how he went from europe he took the european culture to uh, the spanish culture in in uh, in specific to the north americas and the south americas so the spanish people were he 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 himself wasn't uh, spanish but he was commissioned by a spanish king and he was commissioned to document the exact distance from the homeland so he used a very simple method he used to calculate the speed of his ship and he used to keep the speed constant so how do you calculate the speed of ship you just drop something from the start of the ship and uh, you measure the time till it reaches the back of the ship you can measure time by using an hour glass which is on the ship and you know the length of the ship so distance upon time gives you the speed and after that you just need to keep on measuring the amount of time you have been traveling and just multiply that speed by whatever time you you were traveling and you get the exact distance so, uh, christopher columbus was had had a dedicated team which was looking into this and his expedition was successful he was able to document the exact distances but again the hourglass uh, which was used to keep the time or to measure the time uh, even those hourglasses were uh, getting out of sync after some time because of human error because of the waves anything so uh, to keep those hourglasses intact or uh, to keep, to recalibrate recalib them he used to use the nocturnal which we talked about earlier so the three stars which i told you about the first one of them is the brightest star in ursa major which is the north star or polaris or in india we call it the dhruva tara and the next two stars are the uh, uh, are in the ursa major uh, constellation the first two of the saptarishi okay so ursa major is a very big constellation second largest but uh, the brightest part of that constellation are these seven stars which you can see on the right hand side and those seven stars uh, are what uh, or the first two stars uh, in those seven stars are what uh, we should point the nocturnal towards so uh, the first two stars of saptarishi and dhruva tara or north star if we align all these three in a in a uh, in a nocturnal device and if you know the date uh, of the day then you are able to tell exactly what time it is and he used uh, that information to recalibrate his hourglass again pretty impressive yes so now let's move on to the real uh, or we can say very sophisticated phase of navigation in in human history so this is an image of a very important device uh, there was a competition in britain the british government made people or made scientists compete for making this device uh, the the competition was called as finding the solution for the longitude problem okay so we'll get into that first we'll discuss uh, the basics of navigation so what do you need in order to navigate or in uh, in order to go from one place to another so uh, you need uh, the basic things you need are your location the location where you are going to travel all right and the distance between these two locations now uh, the other two things the uh, location where you want to travel and the distance can be found out by trial and error but in order to perfect your uh, travel you need to know your location at every point in in that path so to do that we need at least two angles okay so you all know about latitudes and longitudes so latitude is the uh, measure or the angle 
uh, at which you are from equator equator is zero degree latitude and anything above that is positive anything below that is a negative latitude so latitude goes from zero to 90 degrees 90 degrees is in the northern uh, north pole and then in the southern direction it goes from zero to minus 90 degrees so the latitude range is from minus 90 to plus 90 uh, we already saw how how we can calculate the uh, the we, we didn't see the actual calculation but we know uh, what tools we can use uh, and those tools uh, one of those tools is a sextant uh, but in case of uh, navigation we also need the second angle which is the longitude now the problem with longitude is equator uh, in case of latitude equator is equator can only be one line correct because equator is a disk which is perpendicular to the axis of rotation of earth that can only be one line there can't be two equators but in case of longitudes there can be infinite number of longitudes so there can be infinite number of uh, circles great circles we call them around earth which can uh, prove to be the longitudes so which one should we uh, should we select uh, it was easier for equator because of the axis but there is no such reference uh, in case of the longitudes so we mutually agreed or the world mutually agreed although there were some confrontations the french and british fought over uh, their uh, their respective uh, datums but yeah uh, we we were able to settle uh, as as a human civilization we were able to settle on one point uh, that is closer to london uk uh, the name of that point is greenwich greenwich royal observatory so the meridian or the longitude which goes from greenwich that's that we have uh, defined as the prime meridian so that we have taken as the reference point so if we if we want to know the longitude of our location we need the uh, local time at our location and we need the longitude or the uh, local time at uh, greenwich meridian and we call it the greenwich meridian time or gmt all right so as we discussed earlier the, the longitude problem and the solution uh, of uh, to the longitude problem was to know exactly how much uh, uh, or what is the time at greenwich so if you are in india and you want uh, the longitude of india you just add 5 hours and 30 minutes to the gmt right we are plus 530 in a time zone uh, the time zone of new delhi is plus 530 with respect to gmt uh, so the solution was to find the time at GMT but how can you find the time uh, at GMT in those ages without any internet you can do one thing you can go to London you can set your clocks according to GMT you can come back to India with the same clock and then you can uh, find the time in India uh, by using one of the techniques of uh, nocturnal or even by using the sundial and then that's that's it then based on that you get the degrees by which uh, by how far away you are from london but the only uh, thing with uh, or the only problem with that is uh, you cannot actually take a medieval european clock from london to india without changing its mechanism or without uh, adding some delay or without adding some error into it because the uh, most of the trade was done via the ships and uh, via the navy the clocks were on the ships and the ships have a tendency to go through large waves uh, they go through different climates cold uh, sometimes humid and all of these things have a very profound effect on the mechanism of clocks uh, so how can you be certain whether the time the clock is showing is exactly equal to the gmt so for doing that we need a better clock or a very sturdy clock and that's what the longitude problem was uh, there was a 20000 pound uh, prize to who, whomever uh, solved this problem uh, and there was a genius uh, in in uh, in in britain who solved it uh, his name was john harrison so there is an entire movie on this exact uh, exact uh, and an entire book on this exact longitude problem you can have a look at it so uh, 
we'll we'll get back to this slide afterwards we'll first discuss about john harrison's clock yeah so john harrison made a chronometer so the clock is nothing but a chronometer so the first iteration of that chronometer is the h1 which you can see on the left hand side it is a pretty intricate and very confusing design but it was capable of small range uh, naval expeditions so within the europe you were able to uh, use h1 uh, or this h1 uh, type of clock and you were good to go now the second one the h2 uh, is a better version it is more compact it is more sturdy but still not up to the mark and then we get the h3 which is even better uh, h3 was also used by royal navy uh, for several years but again because of its massive size uh, it had inherent problems inside it so finally the device which uh, won the latitude problem or the latitude prize was this one the chronometer so the h4 iteration of the chronometer uh, was the one which actually got him the prize you can see it is so compact it, it so compact it can uh, fit in your palm and that's something which uh, won't budge to the to the tidal forces or the forces of humidity forces of temperature change so h4 was uh, one of the most instrumental uh, tools used by royal navy it is arguably it is said that without uh, such a chronometer without such a Uh, device of time keeping the royal navy and by extension the british empire could never uh, span out the whole world so everything everywhere they went every colonies they uh, captured all of that was possible because the royal navy had superior technology again how the technology uh, gives power to certain certain civilizations that's so a small island nation was able to rule the entire world based on a simple technology uh, and you can uh, on the on the right hand side you can see how intricate the mechanism is only 40 to 60 people in britain were uh, said to know the um, workmanship behind it so it was a very very uh, skilled labor and they were protected by the government because uh, this was a this was an art and it was a very crucial technology yes so uh, we'll just go back to the slide which we skipped yeah so the, in this slide uh, what we are depicting is how we can uh, measure the longitude of any given uh, any given point on on earth so the the basic of astronomy is if you if you are standing at certain place the point exactly over your head is called as the zenith and the point exactly below zenith on earth is called as the geographic position or gp okay these are two corresponding points for every gp there is exactly one zenith and for every zenith there is exactly one gp so the idea behind this is if you know the location of star exactly above your head if you know the latitude and longitude of the star on the celestial sphere not on earth but on the celestial sphere then you can find the location of you or or the person or exactly uh, or the or the point exactly at the gp which will be the same thing the angles will be same uh, despite the change in radii the celestial sphere is of obviously uh, larger than the earth's earth's uh, radius but despite these uh, these changes the angles remain same so the angle or the location of Uh, of any star which is at your zenith if you know that then that's exactly your location on earth in terms of angles yeah so these are the basic uh, definitions of what uh, zenith distance is what is the greenwich hour circle so the circle which runs from the greenwich local hour angle so the hour angle at your location which you can find by using a sundial then prime hour circle you can have a look at these and at the last you can uh, at the, uh, the the very last entry is 1 arc minute equal to 1 nautical mile so on earth uh, we can easily calculate what is the amount of distance uh, in terms of degrees why because we know the radius of earth which is 6400 kilometers so using simple uh, geometry you can find the circumference of earth 
and if the circumference is 360 degrees then how much will be 1 degree so whatever that 1 degree is on earth that is called as 1 nautical mile and it turns out to be 1.8 kilometers you can do the math uh, yourself yeah now let's move on let's get to the next slides yeah so many of you might know what this is uh, this is uh, this photograph in particular is called as a star tree uh, there is a reason why I have added this photograph. Uh, as you can see, the there are concentric circles at various radius from a single point or a or a common center. Now, what is this? This is no, these are nothing but long exposure photographs of stars. Uh, what this photo depicts is the axis of Earth's rotation. The axis around which the Earth is rotating is exactly pointed towards one star. Okay, uh, not not exactly, but approximately one to two minutes away from it. And because of this, all other stars, even sun and moon, appear to be going in round circles around this star or around this axis. So as you go from uh, zenith to the northern direction, the uh, radius of the circle goes on decreasing. And at the center, you can see... Uh, this one a bright star with a very small circle traced out so that circle is just a few minutes in radius and because it is a very bright star it is, it is uh, easily it can be easily found and that star is Polaris or the North Star so to find Polaris uh, there are various ways and once you know uh, the location of Polaris you know your latitude right away now, uh, some of you might be well acquainted with geometry, uh, but in geometry, uh, in the in the physical applications of geometry, we can approximate some distances. So, with respect to the size of Earth, the distance between Earth and the North Star is very large. We can we can say it to be infinity, and because of that, uh, if you are at a certain latitude on Earth and you look at the uh, North Star or Polaris then the elevation at which this Polaris is, is your exact latitude. It is again simple geometry and approximation of uh, length of infinity. So there is a simple example here. Uh, this is the sky chart or the sky map of Cincinnati where I am living right now. And that is Polaris in the, in the middle. This is Polaris. So the, the elevation angle of Polaris is th at 39 degrees. So 39 degrees above horizon is where the Polaris is located and the latitude of uh, Cincinnati is also 39 degrees 39 degrees on the northern side so positive 39 degrees uh, for Pune uh, for example the, the Polaris is at 18.5 degrees and the latitude of Pune is 18.5 degrees so that's how easy it is to find latitude uh, by using Polaris but again longitude finding longitude needs timekeeping and knowing the local local angle local hour angle all right so uh, afterwards you can just uh, by by using some sky charts you can find the elevation of polaris in your city and you can cross check whether the astronomy whether the science works out so now let's get on to how how do we find the north star right once we find it we are done for the latitude so how do we find it uh, there are three main pointers which point towards the north star easily one of them is the ursa major which we talked about so uh, on the on the bottom side of this image we can see the constellation of ursa major not the entire constellation just a small part of it we call it saptarishi Right now in the night sky, you, uh, you can, uh, after even after this lecture, you can go out and look at Saptarishi, it will be there. So Saptarishi can be used to find North Star. Uh, if you join the second and first star of Saptarishi and trace out that line, if you trace out that line five times its size, five times the size between those two stars, then it uh, takes you to the North Star. So that is a very uh, famous way to find it. But uh, Saptarishi might not be in the night sky every day. Okay, so based on where the Earth is, in, or based on nth day of the year, uh, 
in in let's say in november december uh, saptarishi won't be visible in the in the night sky so at that time you will need to use some other constellation so there is a diametrically opposite constellation to saptarishi known as cassiopeia in india we call it sharmishtha so it is a uh, cute m shape and if you uh, draw an angle bisector of the first triangle of the first uh, triangle formed by joining the three first three stars if you draw an angle bisector that takes you to the north star as well and uh, the third one which you can use is cephus cephus is a constellation uh, it directly points an arrow uh, as you can see it is not exactly pointing it towards the north star but again there is nothing more bright than north star in that area uh, is north star the brightest star no it is not it is not even in the top 10 but in that part of the sky it is pretty bright okay so now we found out uh, a method to uh, locate the latitude by using north star what if you want the latitude in the daylight you cannot see the north star in daylight so for that you can use sun uh, now there is a uh, property of sun called as declination angle that property arises because our our axis of rotation is tilted the axis of rotation of earth is tilted towards the plane uh, with respect to the plane of uh, plane of the solar system and that tilt is of 23.5 degrees this tilt is the reason why we have seasons if it was uh, spinning exactly uh, exactly perpendicular to the plane then we would have we, we we would have only one season uh, the seasons exist because of this tilt and the tilt is of 23.5 degrees and hence again by simple geometry you can find out that the sun in your given sky in any given sky goes from minus 23 uh, minus 23.5 degrees to 23.5 degrees in one year not not in a day or not in a week but in a complete year it traces a kind of a sinusoidal wave between these two bounds so on earth these bounds are 23.5 degree latitude on the north and 23.5 degree latitude on the south so these are called as tropic of cancer and tropic of capricornus and the patch between these two tropics is called as the tropical region uh, tropical region so india uh, the uh, almost the entire nation except i guess the union territories of uh, jammu kashmir and ladakh except those two all the things uh, all the states and union territories of india come in in the tropical region uh, now the tropical region enjoy one very interesting phenomena which the european countries and the american countries can't and that phenomena is the zero shadow day so right now uh, in india zero shadow day is going on in various places so the sun is moving in the northern direction right now in a, is it actually moving no but because earth is going around sun with a tilted axis we we perceive it to be moving every day moving up and up uh, to the north and similarly going to south so twice in a year we get zero shadow day where the sun is exactly at zenith so exactly over our head so the uh, latitude of sun on the celestial sphere matches with the latitude of your location and that's when the sun is at zenith and you are at its gp and you have no shadow on that day so that's called zero shadow day so this angle of uh, how far tilted uh, the orbit of sun is the apparent orbit of sun is is called as the declination angle so there are some certain formula i have uh, i've listed Uh, these formula are based on three cases so the first case is you are on the northern side sun is also on the northern side of the equator uh, you are on the northern side the sun is on the southern side and both of you are on the southern side so these three formula can be used to find declination angle first and based on the declination angle you can find your latitude so you can just go through these formula again simple geometry nothing very complex any uh, just simple things which can be done by 12th standard pass pass out yes so now we know uh, how to find the latitude how to find the north star 
uh, but what if there are clouds on the northern direction we are we are we are exploring all the cases all possible cases so uh, there are there, there is a star which can accurately tell you what is the actual east and west direction and the name of that star is mintaka so mintaka is uh, one of the brightest stars in the constellation of orion you might have uh, seen orion uh, everyone has seen orion it is a very popular constellation it is a very uh, dominating constellation in the winter sky all of you might have seen the three stars almost in a perfect line so the third star in 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 that formation is called as mintaka it forms the belt of orion orion is uh, said to be a warrior and uh, these three stars are the belt of orion so the property of mintaka is mintaka rises exactly from the east and sets exactly at the west so wherever you are on earth uh, the celestial sphere won't change its position according to your location uh, so mintaka will always at any given time rise above the horizon from east and set at the west if you are further north these east and west directions are on the southern side but if you are on the uh, in the southern hemisphere these east and west are on more more to the northern sides yeah and if you are in the southern hemisphere let's say you are not in the northern hemisphere uh, as we discussed earlier whatever is the elevation of uh, north star that is the elevation on earth right so uh, let's say you are at equator so at equator the north star will be at 0 degrees that is at horizon so if you go beyond equator in the southern direction you won't be able to see north star it will never never come above uh, above the uh, above the horizon so what would you do in that case to find the directions you can use mintaka or if you want the exact south direction you can use a very famous constellation in the southern hemisphere the name of that constellation is crux crux or the southern cross we call it now this constellation is so famous that many uh, southern hemisphere countries have that this constellation on their flags okay so you can check the flag of australia new zealand papua new guinea uh brazil you can check the flags of these uh, nations all of them have this constellation on their flags even the southern command of indian army which is uh, located in pune which is headquartered in pune even the southern command of indian army has a crux on its logo or 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 on, on its flag so that's how important uh, or that's how dominant this uh, shape is in the southern sky uh so along with crux there are two pointer stars so these two pointer stars are very bright uh, they are probably even brighter than the crux itself so these two things the pointer stars and the crux can be used to find the southern direction so if you extend the larger side of the crux or the larger diagonal of the crux and if you draw a perpendicular bisector of the line joining the pointer stars if you draw a perpendicular bisector and if you draw Uh, and if you extend uh, the larger line uh, or the larger diagonal of crux wherever they intersect at from that point uh, just draw a simple perpendicular to the horizon that is your south now the true south is 1 to 2 degrees away from that perpendicular but again 1 to 2 degrees in the vast terrain of 360 degrees is negligible Uh, and we can use this method at any uh, time of the night so wherever the crux is the crux will go from east to west and throughout that path uh, even if their position changes their intersection point will always point towards southern direction yeah uh, now one more thing uh, which we talked about earlier was the nocturnal the use of nocturnal and how that can tell you the exact time or, or the exact lo local time uh, so just imagine a a big clock uh, in our clock we have 1 to 12 hours imagine 1 to 24 hours uh, in a clock and if you uh, draw a line from north star and the first two stars of big dipper or the saptarishi then this line will act as an hour hand okay so on march 17th exactly at noon exactly at 12 Uh, in the night uh, the the big dipper uh, clock will be at 24 that is noon so 
the simple formula to calculate the time based on uh, based on big dipper is given below so the dipper time is whatever uh, angle the line joining these three stars is making okay so let's say it is uh, the line is somewhere here somewhere pointing towards 8 so then the dipper time will be 8 minus 2 into the number of months since March 17th uh, again this this clock is based on the date uh, because because earth goes around sun and the background keeps on changing background of stars keeps on changing that's why we need to compensate for it and you can find the approximate time in hours obviously in hours by using this method okay now let's get on to what the naval uh, naval forces actually did in back in the time today they just use electronic devices but back in the time what the naval forces actually did so uh, in the in this image you can see a star here right so what uh, they used to do was they used to use any of the tools we uh, we listed earlier let's say the sextant and by using the sextant they uh, found out the altitude which i have shown here the altitude of a of a star now zenith distance uh, is the complement of that altitude you know the complementary angles right uh, addition of two angles if it is 90 degrees it is the complement uh, those two are called as complementary angles now what is this complementary angle the angle from horizon is a complement of the angle from zenith and that angle from zenith is called as zenith distance so it is 90 minus the altitude angle so once you find this uh, altitude angle of any any given star you immediately know the zenith angle or the zenith distance and based on the zenith distance you can trace uh, trace a circle of that many degrees now we already know how to convert degrees into kilometers in terms of earth right because uh, it, now all of this will change on different planets okay so if you go to mars one nautical mile will be different for mars so one nautical mile for earth uh, is different for moon is different for sun is different so on earth if you know the zenith distance you can trace a circle on earth's surface and if you know what star it is uh, so there are 57 very bright stars which are listed in almanacs so there are naval almanacs even there are aerial almanacs you can have a look at them so what these almanacs do is they list the uh, positions of stars throughout the year by using maths by using calculations you can predict because uh, the stars will never change their position with respect to each other you can very accurately predict uh, where they will be on a given day on and uh, at a given time so by using the almanac of for that particular star you can know its latitude and longitude on the celestial sphere and uh, the thing which we talked about earlier the zenith and the gp we we use the same property here and if we know the uh, the latitude longitude of uh, that star using almanac we can trace a circle on earth uh, which is equal to the uh, whose whose cone angle or whose conical angle is equal to the zenith distance angle so you are somewhere on that on that circle okay now if you if your zenith distance or the zenith angle is more if you uh, if the elevation is let's say 40 degrees and if the elevation is 80 degrees then the 80 degree elevation from from uh, uh, horizon will have a small zenith angle and because of the small zenith angle we will have a small circle now we do this three times okay we do this for various stars uh, when we do it for two stars we get intersection of two circles so you might be at either points and if you do it for the third star we get a perfect intersection so you have your location has to be there so this is called as the angle of uh, the method of triangulation uh, but this goes out of control once you don't have any stars near your zenith so if the angle uh, goes beyond 10 degrees from zenith then this uh, method is not usable anymore because you cannot trace accurately on a map uh, on, a, on a bigger map you can get big maps but uh, you cannot trace accurately the angles and you cannot get the location accurately on big maps so 
although this is a crude method it is still uh, the basis of what we use in gps now we'll uh, get directly into the modern era so in the modern era uh, all of us have used gps at some point of uh, some point of our life so gps is nothing but global pos positioning system it is one of the uh, global navigation systems there are a lot of them uh, i have listed four of them gps uh, galileo glonass and baidu baidu 2 are uh, global navigation systems and then the regional navigation systems baidu 1 irnss navic and qzss so uh, we'll quickly list out which countries developed these technologies so the gps as we know is an american technology it is funded by uh, american army or the united states army so it is it is a project completely funded by uh, us army and it is free to use for anyone on the planet so that's amazing actually then glonass glonass is developed by russia and indian army uh, until recently uh, we didn't have our own uh, positioning system or navigation system so we leased it out from russia so glonass uh, I india even used glonass the indian army used glonass uh, in case of galileo it is developed by european union baidu 2 is developed by china and then the regional navigation systems baidu 1 is developed by china uh, irnss or we have nicknamed it mavic is developed by india and qzss is developed by japan so these are the number of satellites uh, which are included in this system so there are 24 in GPS, 30 in Baidu, 7 in Navic and so on. Now the main difference between global satellite uh, navigation and the regional satellite navigation is the regional uh, satellites which provide navigation are all geocentric, uh, sorry, geostationary, not geocentric, geostationary satellites. So they are pinned to a certain point on earth. So if you, if you match the speed of rotation or speed of revolution of satellite with the speed of rotation of earth then the satellite is as good as stationary in the space even though it is going around earth it is stationary with respect to one point on earth so that is the case of regional uh, navigation satellites and we have seven such satellites covering the entire uh, indian subcontinent along with some sark nations bhutan pakistan uh, nepal bangladesh Sri Lanka, Maldives, etc., and a broad region of Indian Ocean as well. So that's the basic difference. Uh, in in global navigation systems, uh, the the satellites aren't uh, geostationary. Uh, they are not pinned to one uh, location on Earth. So they keep on moving. They keep on revolving around Earth, and they keep on going over different points on Earth. Uh, the the salient feature of GPS is at any given point, wherever you are on Earth there are at least four satellites in your line of sight now line of sight is a different thing uh, when it comes to navigation systems or satellite navigation there might be a mountain between you and the satellite but if the satellite is above the horizon it is said to be in, in your uh, line of sight so there are at least four such satellites at all times uh, looking look uh, looking at any point on earth in, in the GPS system yeah so just like the triangulation method uh, in the GPS system we use the trilateration method so it is nothing but uh, the extension of the previous method in the previous method we used circles in this method we use spheres so as I told you about the four satellites uh, they send their location their exact location to your mobile device uh, and they send it again after a certain time interval and your phone your your normal mobile phone is has such a powerful computer that based on those two signals it can compute the exact distance between you and the satellite so the, all of that happens inside your phone uh, your phone gathers information from various satellites it calculates the distance it uh, imaginary it draws imaginary spheres and wherever those spheres intersect that's your location and uh, the display system of uh, your phone shows that location so this is a very very powerful computer yes so that was about trial iteration method uh, 
And now the last point in the slide, uh, in this presentation, uh, is the interstellar navigation. So uh, I'm sure most of you might have seen the movie Interstellar. There is a famous dialogue in it. Uh, mankind was meant to born on Earth, but it was never meant to die here. So uh, maybe in some decades or maybe in some centuries, we are going to travel outside our solar system because if we don't, eventually uh, something catastrophic will kill us. And if we want to survive as a species, we need to become explorers, right? So uh, for that, we'll have to navigate through the interstellar space. Now for navigating in the interstellar space, you cannot use uh, the GPS, which was designed for Earth, right? Because all of its points uh, of reference are on Earth. The satellites are revolving around Earth. So what can you use then? Uh, even you, you, you cannot even use the sun because we are going outside the solar system. You cannot use sun as the datum if you are going outside the solar system. So what is something which is which can be used as a reference point which doesn't change no matter where you are but it is distant enough so that we can travel among stars. The stars are light years away from us. So even these reference points need to be light years away from us. So one such reference point uh, yeah, this is an image. We will get back to this image. Just think about what is depicted in the image. Uh, this is nothing but the stellar address of solar of our solar system. So you might uh, write your address as the apartment number, the area code, then the city, then the country where you are from. Similarly, this image is our or uh, Earth's or solar system's uh, stellar address. So. Uh, Let's see what, what this means, okay? Yeah. So those points of uh, certainty or those points of reference, we can use uh, pulsars in that case. So pulsars are nothing but neutron stars which are revolving around a certain axis, but they are also throwing radio uh, signals or radio radiation uh, in a different angle. As you can see in this animation, the cone is throwing radiation in all directions whereas it is revolving around a perpendicular axis. So because of this uh, earth gets in the line of sight of this radiation every once in a while and the first pulsar was discovered in 1967 and since then its rotation period hasn't changed. So how can we use this right? So if we have enough number of pulsars uh, around ourselves then we can form a grid within those uh, pulsars. So in the third image, as you can see, the mesh grid, you can travel freely uh, and use the pulsars for navigation inside that mesh grid. Uh, now, how, uh, how accurate is it, right? So it turns out the pulsars are so accurate that we can even use it on Earth instead of GPS. They are not as good as GPS, of course, because they are very far away but they are as good as GPS. So the accuracy of GPS navigation is around three meters for, for us and the accuracy of pulsar navigation is 30 meters. So not a very uh, bad thing to have, right? 30 meters accuracy by using something which is light years away from us, that is a pretty good application. All right. Yeah, so let's go back to the image. So th what this image uh, depicts is every line th at the center is our solar system and every line traced out from the center is pointing towards a pulsar. Okay. And the dashes you can see in that, in that line are the revolution periods of those pulsars. So that is how you can uh, address the solar system. That is how you can navigate in interstellar space. So uh, I have some audios of uh, what a pulsar might sound like. So we collect the radio waves and we transfer or we convert that radio signal into audio signal. And these are the sounds which are produced by pulsars. I will play them one by one. So have a look. This one has the rotation period of 1.4 uh, rotations per second. So it rotates 1.4 times per second. 
second one has the rotation period of 3.9 uh, rotations per second. So the last one, the 716 rotations per second is the fastest pulsar we have ever traced. So it rotates around itself 716 times in just one second. Just imagine how fast it might be. And yeah, this is the last uh, slide of the presentation. Uh, this is the image of the pale blue dot. Uh, the, the image is called as pale blue dot. This is clicked by Voyager 1. So when Voyager 1 went in the interstellar space, it went past Pluto. It turned back and it clicked a photograph, a family photo of, of the solar system. And this thing which you can see here, the pale blue dot, that is Earth. Uh, this is a cropped image of the entire image. Uh, but yeah, this is this is what Earth looks like from beyond Pluto. And uh, what this image depicts is how how small our existence is with respect to the vast arena of uh, universe. But still, because we were we are able to we are able to grasp how the physics of the universe works, we are we have a special place in in this universe. And Carl Sagan has put this image in very beautiful words. So maybe after this lecture, just go and find pale blue dot by Carl Sagan. Listen to that, uh, listen to that lecture, uh, listen to that speech. It is one of the most beautiful things you'll ever, ever listen to. Uh, and I guess that is it. Uh, I thank you all for joining me today. Uh, I'm representing Jyotir Vidya Parisamstha and thank you for listening to me. I hope you all enjoyed the presentation and I'll be waiting for some of the questions if you have. You can ask them in the live chat. Uh, yeah. I'm waiting for any questions. Uh, if you are able to hear me please send any queries you have related to the presentation i'll be answering uh, four to five of them okay so ruday uh, uh, from the gifzer astronomy club has sent me some questions uh, so let's go through them one by one yeah so the first question is how they can measure the exact time i'm not uh, really sure about which time you are talking about uh, it, if if the time which you are talking about is uh, in the gps systems then they have atomic clocks on on board gps so they even take care of the rotation or the general relativity uh, the effect of general relativity uh, which comes into picture just because of rotation around Earth. So they uh, use atomic clocks on GPS satellites. Every satellite has one atomic clock. Uh, so atomic clock is nothing but a recalibration method. So just like Christopher Columbus recalibrated his hourglass with uh, the nocturnal device, uh, in GPS systems, the, the, the time is recalibrated by using atomic clocks or the spin of an electron around uh, one atom. So that is the datum, that is the uh, thing against which the time is, uh, time is uh, recalibrated. The second question, what is the difference between equator and the prime meridian? So uh, equator is a latitude and prime meridian is the longitude. Both are great circles. Great circle is anything uh, which is uh, the largest line or the largest circle you can draw around earth there can be infinite number of uh, great circles but there is only one equator and there is only one equator because uh, the equator is perpendicular to the axis of rotation and there can be many prime meridians but we as a civilization have decided to take only one datum point because it is easier to calculate uh, everything else based on that datum and that datum goes from greenwich meridian uh, or the Greenwich Meridian time which runs through the Royal Observatory near London. So that is the prime meridian. So these two uh, these two rings I will say are 
perpendicular to each other the prime meridian and the equator the third question is how to locate pointer stars yes so uh, crux and pointer stars are kind of a twin uh, twin phenomena the thing is in in the sky you can join any four points and call it crux right there are a lot of crosses which can uh, closely resemble the shape of crux but if you see two very bright stars near crux uh, near near such a formation then that is the actual crux so you need crux to find the pointer stars and you need pointer stars to find the crux so it is kind of a uh, combined method of finding yes so the next question is global navigation system is different from regional navigation or both are same yes so the navigation the math behind it uh, will remain the same the intersection of spheres will remain the same but the global in the global navigation system you will be able to find your location anywhere on earth and in the regional navigation system it is only it is only confined to particular region on earth so for example india's uh, regional navigation system called navic or, or irnss focuses only on india uh, and it uses geostationary satellites for doing that so that's the basic difference between these two the type of satellites used as well as uh, the accessibility of the information so for regional it is only related to a particular area on earth whereas for global you can find uh, the location anywhere on earth okay the next question is what sort of difference does a fast rotating pulsar has from the so slow rotating pulsar so uh, there is as far as uh, navigation is concerned uh, this this rotation speed shouldn't uh, shouldn't affect anything because all we are doing is using that their rotation speed as reference so whatever it is as long as it remains constant we are good to go now why some of them uh, rotate faster and some of them rotate slower can have various reasons so maybe one of them was a uh, two star system at at the stars at the start and neutron star you 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 should basically uh, read more about neutron stars so neutron stars are formed after the death of a of a massive star and if it is a two star system then they are already going around each other and if they die in that state maybe uh, they are flung out of space and maybe they get uh, a higher rate of spin but as long as the rate of spin is constant we can use the neutron stars uh, we can use uh, the pulsars as our datum yes again a question re related to pulsars uh, is there any research going on at present to use them in earth, on earth yes so actually uh, nasa has an airplane which doesn't use gps uh, or doesn't use the uh, uh, traditional methods of navigating it uses uh, uses the location based on the pulsar stars uh, uh, neutron stars called as pulsars so uh, i i don't know the exact name of the project but nasa has a test plane which it flows for months uh, which it flies for months at end uh, in the space and Uh, what they are doing is they are calibrating their uh, pulsars uh, or they are refining their pulsar based navigation system so yes it is it is used right now uh, it is an ongoing project in nasa next question which navigation system is used mostly and the reasons for it so the uh, most easy to get navigation system is the gps which is uh, the american system and it is easier to uh, to get the information from this satellites it is open source so the one good thing uh, us army has done is they have opened it to the entire world so the american taxpayers are actually paying uh, for the gps but everyone on earth can use it anyone with a simple simple phone a simple computer chip can access that technology and i think gps will be the best navigation system currently in use on earth obviously the next question is what's the dif distance between earth and the first pulsar found 
so i guess uh, i know the exact answer i'll have to cross check once but it is some 100 light years away uh, 120 or 140 light years away i'll i'll have to check uh, the interesting thing about the first pulsar is uh, when they actually found it when they actually got the signal they uh, they thought that this is a radio signal coming from interstellar space so this might be an alien civilization uh, but afterwards uh, this this was uh, first discovered in cambridge so there was a uh, graduate student at cambridge who was using a radio telescope and uh, he found out the first signal uh, this uh, actually the discovery of pulsar has got a nobel prize in 1974 i guess so the 1974 nobel prize of physics went to the discovery of pulsar Uh, I don't know exactly how far it is, but uh, you can find that information very easily. Yeah, so I think that was it. Uh, these were all the questions. Uh, I think my uh, email ID is listed in the description. If you have any further questions, you can always reach out to me, and I will definitely answer all of them. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Gibbsar Astronomy Club and the Society for Aerospace and Mechanical Engineers. Uh, thank you all for giving your valuable time.